This week's episodes were brought to you by the generous support of Jay Merley. So, we're still fairly early on, but we've got a fair amount of stuff going on. If we go ahead, let me go and maximize on play over here. <clears throat> See, my plan was to do this for two hours. I don't know, without enough pre-planning, I'm a little bit worried that we won't quite make it there. Um, so when we hit play, we've got like galactic generation, we create planets, we do that, we create the visual representation of planets. And we've also got it so that when we click on a, um, sorry, not a planet, a star system. When we click on a star system, we open up the, like this view star system window. And that's what we're gonna be working on today. Is, uh, is populating this window with the information about the planets and, and whatnot that the star system has. Um, and the thing is, there are, there are in, in a very like real way, better, better ways of making it so that when you click on something, <clears throat> how do you get into your system view? I mean, if we were running Stellaris, I am running the music for Stellaris in the background just to have a, a little something something going on. Um, you know, in Stellaris and in many things, you just zoom in, right? Or well, it's Stellaris that actually changes the view mode, right? It's got it's got the galactic scene and it's got the planet scene, but the planet scene is, is full screen. But some some games you can just zoom in and things appear and then zoom out and they disappear. Um, and yeah, you just like at a certain zoom level, you actually probably show the game objects and when you're far away, you just hide the game objects. And the thing is, not only would that kind of possibly look nicer, it would actually be easier to make in many, many, many ways uh, than working out this, this you know, windowed interface in a separate view thing. But I really want to like try and experiment with the idea of like <clears throat> this sort of like windowed interface where it's got its own, probably its own 3D scene going on within this. One moment. This is why I never stream first thing in the morning. <sighs> my whole, my, my face is still asleep. That's okay, we can do this. <clears throat> so yeah, so we're here and that's what we're gonna, we're gonna try to populate the system view here um, at this point. Now, this comes up, there is a script that gets run. Actually, how, how does it come up? What triggers, we have a window a win a view manager. That's what we have over here. Um, yeah. We have this view manager, and this is the thing that is responsible for showing and hiding views. And right now it's just doing it by setting views to be active or unactive. Missed a donation and a few subs. Of course I did, of course I did. <clears throat> uh, did I got Elf? Looks to me like Elf was the last one. Yeah, Katie and Elf. I don't think I missed another one. We got some bits from Chris Isis, thank you very much, and Red Eye Hawk, cheers to you as well. And yeah, so many resubs. 38 months from Xynthia, 33 months from Gerdo, 53 months from Rax, 32 months from Milo, 16 months from Alua, jeez. Case, hey! Oh, missed 18 months, I'm so sorry, Case, but thank you very much for 19 months. Case, one of the, the, the dependable Dota partners. <laughs> Drog at 13. And then Paradox, yeah, was the three-month one. Uh, cheers. And there's a bunch more, but we're gonna have to, uh, we're gonna have to code. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, there's gonna be a little bit of sniffling at the start here because I think, I mean, hopefully I'm not actually sick. I don't think I am. I think it's just because it's so early in the morning. I still have like airplane in my head. There's nothing more glorious than after you get home from like a giant set of flights and take a shower. Oh my God. So good. Okay. So I think that's all it is, but the thing is, and we've got the system view. So the system view is the script that's attached to our, our visual over here for the system, but it doesn't do anything right now. So what we're gonna want is probably some sort of standardized um, approach to what happens when a, get, a view gets enabled or disabled. Now, what we could have is we could have all these views be descended from the same class and have some sort of like expected function to fill out. And th all those things are, are maybe something we look into in the future, but in practice- It's whiskey and chocolate. There's whiskey and chocolate. Hey, X603, thank you very much. I see you have begun to learn how to program uh, using the Raspberry Pi computer. Nice. Uh, hold on. Uh, Raspberry Pi computer and some add-ons at the moment that make different sensors and controllers. So th well, here's a little thanks for me. Raspberry Pi is such a great way to start programming, especially if you <clears throat> want to go into like maybe robotics or something like that, because you can use the Raspberry Pi as the brain to your robots and it's kind of awesome. Um, 
<clears throat> right, so over here, so the instantiation for system view, what I thought was we could have some sort of like public um, void mm, show view kind of thing. And then the idea, okay, those are some interesting little bracket typos. Um, and then the idea being that in the view manager, <clears throat> after you make the view active, you would call the like, um, the, the show view function or something like that. But I think that would be totally redundant. And the reason is that we have various functions built into Unity that are there for instantiation. Now I'm not talking about start. Start only gets run one time. Start gets called before update gets called for the first time. And it's in fact in that order. Update is about to run, um, <clears throat> basically at the start of a frame. If update has never been called, it runs start first. But our views are gonna open and close all the time. So the way we're gonna to respond to that is probably on enable. The difference between start and on enable, on enable runs every time a game object becomes set active. So you set it active, it on enable runs, you go inactive, you set active again, on enable runs again. It also happens to run immediately upon being active instead of waiting for the start of the next frame, which is what start is. That doesn't it's not always relevant, but technically on enable would run before start. But on enable also runs every time. <clears throat> so I think with our views, it's gonna be perfectly fine for us to put in our code in on, on enable here for our system view to be like, okay, let's read in the currently selected system, <clears throat> set up our view, you know, the title bar, make sure the right planets are in there. So that's what we're gonna use. And I don't think we have to like really prepare for anything of the, uh, that's custom otherwise. The gotcha though, is the system view does need to know what our currently selected star system is. When we click on a star system, the system view needs to be. So we have we have this clickable star system. Nope, clickable stars is a tag. We don't actually have any code in that. How do we, is it galaxy visuals? Okay, so galaxy visuals is the thing that's like checking for mouse clicks and things right now on the galaxy map and is also responsible for, hey, we've clicked on a star. So. The galaxy visual is the thing that tells the view manager, hey, please show the system view um, in here. But what we also need to do is we have to tell the system view what star we've clicked on. But we can do that as one thing. So in our system view, we probably need some sort of public uh, star system. Oh, we need to, star system is part of our namespace Caprica. So we need to be able to say using Caprica public star system, there we go, uh, selected star or something like that. And then when we when we click on a star, we're gonna say, hey, system view dot selected star equals this star. Now, we have a copy of clickable star, which isn't what we're looking for. We're looking for get component. Get component what? <clears throat> right, okay, uh, just catching up on chat, there's there were some questions here for our system view about on enable being private. And this is fine. Unity is a little bit weird in terms of how it actually calls this functions. It, it does stuff that I, I don't really, I don't really know. It's like reflections and things like that. It checks to see if a function exists in a class, it's and, and it's already got everything enabled to to sort of call those functions. Anyway, on enable will be will be called automatically by the built-in Unity sort of magic and stuff. And I'm not usually a fan of like magic functions where you need to know the magic words of this and then things just sort of happen somewhere but it, but it do i mean we'll we'll confirm it certainly like either things will work or don't work and you'll we can we'll have some sort of debug system in here to like double check things that like yep um this is running and obviously it's either going to populate the star system or it won't but yeah it's like why does private work but it do uh so the whiskey and chocolate was oh from the atar any Dwarf Fortress streams coming soon? I've missed them. We got a couple of neat ideas for challenges to do. Okay, well, first of all, if you got ideas for challenges, uh, you should tweet me or email me. 
um, with those because those are always really useful. Dwarf Fortress I had strongly baited last, was it last week? Where we played um, Distant Worlds. It was a huge toss up for me between Dwarf Fortress and Distant Worlds. And I was kind of in the mood to play Distant Worlds, but Dwarf Fortress has got to be coming soon because it's been way too freaking long. Thanks for going over that. I always assume to make those overrides public. Yeah, it's it's weird because I think it's inside of mono behavior that it's dealing with some of this stuff. I don't know. It's bizarre. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's not going to hurt whether it's public or protected or private in, in, in practice because you're not too worried about people messing around with the code from outside of things. Okay. Man, oh man. Um, is this, this is the one thing, like, it's the useful thing about doing programming streams is that we can, you know, answer questions real time, which is great. The downside is I, I get distracted. I'm like, where the hell was I again? Uh, we got the selected star. I feel like there was something else I was going to check, but I mean, we're setting the selected star here. Oh, 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 right. Get component. I was like, what component? Because what do we want to pass to it? Presumably what we want to do is pass the, um, the actual star system object, which isn't a component, actually. Uh, clickable star doesn't actually know its thing either. How, okay. Galaxy visuals. Initiate visuals. It instantiates these game objects. Yeah, so the stars that we have set up on the screen Right, when we, run, when we run the game, let me not maximize. Let me hit the, uh, oh, I can't because I've got some compiler errors right here. Yeah, hang on. <clears throat> the stars on the screen right now don't currently have any kind of link back to our actual data stars because we are doing the thing that is very correct uh, most of the time. Oh, uh, you need to start off uh, disabled here. Um, the thing that is mostly co is correct most of the time, which is that we are having a very clear segregation between our sort of data, our model information, and our visual system. Um, this has always been a good thing to do, um, whether you're doing applications or games. It's actually always been a really, really strong thing. And it's doubly important now if you want to start doing things like some of the multi-threaded stuff, the job system. Um, we're not really using the entity component system exactly, although that's also kind of what we're doing in different ways. So anyway, so we've got this, this total segregation between the, uh, the system view and the, there it is, um, and the data. So we have this like star object here and it's got, well, the only thing it's got on it is a script called clickable star. And right now it doesn't do anything. The clickable star script is just used as a filter for us. However, I think what we have to do now is we have to add a little bit of code to clickable star. Not really much. We're just gonna go ahead and say something like, it's not even code. Using um, Caprica, <clears throat> we're just gonna say we have a public star system, star system, all right? We have a star system. We're not gonna need to start, we're not gonna need an update. I mean, we may end up something like this for some sort of animation, but really it's like, this is super bare bones. <clears throat> and then as a bonus, what's Caprica? Caprica is just the namespace that we used. It's, it's, yeah. I've been really excited for um, episode number six of Project Caprica because in the thumbnail, I'm just gonna use a picture of Caprica six from Battlestar Galactica. So anyway, so that's it. It's just, it's just the arbitrary name. This is Project Caprica. Um, right, so now that Clickable Star has that, it means that under Galaxy Visuals over here, when we select a star, we can just say, oh, and yeah, it's um, our Clickable Star the star system attached to this clickable star, we're just gonna go ahead and do that. So what may, what becomes important is over here, this is where we spawn all of our visuals. In this piece of code here, we just look, our galaxy has all the actual data on our stars. We ju just loop through every single little star over here and create a, um, a game object like for the visuals. What we have to do is this visual that gets created, we have to say something like get component clickable star and your star system is this star system over here. So there we go. So now the clickable star has a link back to the data <clears throat> and the view manager, when it gets popped open, and sorry, not the view manager, the, um, the system view, when it gets popped open, this will be filled in, which is gonna be lovely. So we can say something like, um, 
the stars have names? I mean, we must. I don't know if we give them any actual name when we generate the system. That's actually a good question. I mean, at the at start, what we're going to do is we're just going to make sure they're at least numbered. So our galaxy code is the thing that's general. It, it, it's is used to generate the entire galaxy. Um, so this is the star system generating itself. So. Um, There you go. So now the, each star will have a name. It's just going to be star followed by a number. Just because, hey, that'll be really handy to be able to do something like that. Um, good. So in our star, our system view, <clears throat> we can do something like plus uh, selected star dot um, name. Here's an interesting question. Uh, okay, it's like, what's the order thing going to happen? But yeah, we're going to set the name of the star system before it becomes enabled. Okay, so um, so this name should be populated uh, by the time on enable run. So that's going to be okay. Excellent. Uh, the other thing what we're going to do when we get enabled is set our label. And I guess we could do that now. So we have um, we have a prefab that we're using for our, our star over here. This is the prefab, and it's got a label. It's got this little UI element. Um, well, this one's actually the canvas, but it's it has a UI element that has a text component on it. And we're going to want to set it. So let's um, using, uh, what is it? UnityEngine.UI, right? There we go. So on enable, we're going to do something like get component in children of type text. Right now, we only have a single text component. Later on, we might have multiple and we'll have to be a little smarter about this. But we're going to find our only text component. We're going to set the text of that to be equal to our selected star dot name. Okay, I think if we go ahead and run in Unity right now, let's find out if any of this works. <clears throat> Planets and star systems should be named star name plus alpha, beta, gamma, so on. Well, maybe, although typically you actually number them, right? Like it'll be, um, oh, we, text isn't being copied over like expected. That's okay, we'll double check as to why that is in a second. Um, you know, it'll be, uh, so what would be a star name like Spica? So Spica 1, Spica 2, Spica 3. That's how they're numbered in real life, as opposed to alpha, beta, etc. Although we could. There's no reason we couldn't. I mean, it might sound more interesting to have them labeled that way. Prime, and then use some lowercase Roman numbers, 1, 2, 4. Yeah, it's, that's, that's cool, too. Um, oh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm being a derp. Yeah, I'm being a derp for a couple of reasons. Um, this label is not part of the system view, although a title would be. Uh, so yeah, when we run it, we actually do get a little error. We get the debug. I've clicked on star eight, and then it says uh, there's a bit of an error here because I don't have a, a child that has a text component uh, on system view. Yeah, because I'm getting mis mixed up between my system view and my little star. So actually what I want to do is get rid of this line here in our galaxy visuals, when we generate all the stars, it's over here. We want to say something like um, the game object dot get component text, uh, which it doesn't know because we don't have that start that. Um, do I want to do it in here? Actually, no, I don't think I want to do it in here. I think clickable star. is actually where we're going to want to do it. Okay. So if we hit play, now the stars should all be labeled. Dang it. Oh! 
hold on, it's not a text component. It's a text mesh pro UGI UGUI component. Oh. Uh What the hell's the script for that called? Yeah, this is my first time actually using TextMesh Pro. Um, TextMesh uh, Pro scripting reference. Namespace is TM Pro. Okay. And then the object is called Text Mesh Pro. Uh, and it's just .text? It is just .text. Okay. Oops. <laughs> Pay no attention to the Rome video content. <laughs> uh, okay, stop this. Play this. Yeah, I'm just used to using the, the built-in Unity GUI. Ah, God damn you! Why? Is it out of date? <laughs> okay. Yes. Go. Always open in Chrome. Oh, okay. So, wait. Now this is just giving me a link to the mono behavior. Someone in chat probably knows at this point. TMP text. Okay. So what's the what's the correct documentation? Um, because Googling led me to this page which it clearly must not be correct. So I'm curious as to what the correct documentation like reference page for this is. Um, I don't see a TMP text in here. Like you're telling me to use this but there's, there's an error, this doesn't exist. I think the component's called TextMatch Pro UGUI. And yeah, the error is not, um, the error is not what I'm using here. The error is, uh, oh, the, U, the Unity GUI version of it. Oh, I see, okay, so it's a different class. I mean, it does say the UG. Okay, let's try this again then. That's probably it. I was looking for the wrong object name. Do, 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 do. Hey, we have star names now. Okay, that's it. So the class is called TextMatch Pro, the Unity GUI version of it. Man. Interesting, but you still need You still need the TMP Pro um, namespace. It's not, they didn't move this class into say the Unity a a UI namespace or something like that. All right, fair enough. Anyway, um, so we got you and when we click on a star, yeah, it says click on a star with a certain name, which is fine. Then we still get the error that we were running. Uh, are we, did I not save this? We shouldn't get any error whatsoever because I removed that code, but I may have not saved it. <clears throat> there you go. No error anymore. Yeah. Okay. I hadn't saved that file. All right. But <clears throat> it does confirm that we clicked on star 40. That, that presumably was correct. Let's try it again. Uh, so uh, star 48 over here. I'm going to click on it small so it's hard to do there it is 
uh, click on star 48. Okay, that's all linked up. Great, <clears throat> so now I wanna work on system view over here. Um, now, and that probably includes making this look a little less ugly. I, I still like using the like super magenta to show like uh, there's something missing here. That's the default behavior in in Unity, if you don't have a material assigned to a mesh that's being rendered, it does it in this like horrible color, so you can't miss it. And that's certainly a habit that I like to continue myself. Um, <clears throat> you got a panel, we got a title bar and everything, so we're gonna put in some sort of title. Um, I guess we should probably just commit to using Text Match Pro for as much things as possible, because uh, it does it can look a lot better. Although I'm still sort of old schooly and like, I don't think it's gonna matter one way or another for this. And I suspect that um, this text might be a little more lightweight. I don't know, it doesn't matter. We can switch back and forth pretty easily. Uh, so this is just gonna be the text in our title bar. So it's gonna be something like probably, probably left a line. Let's see, let's make this as as big as the title bar itself, that's fine. Um, alt and click. There we go. <clears throat> uh, left aligned, it's middle aligned. Are you having video issues? Really? I don't know. Uh, we got whiskey and chocolate. Yeah, it's the ATAR. Hey, the ATAR. Thank you very much. Yeah, can't read the message because the colors are so garish. Email sent. Oh yeah, the email. Yes, less lovely, lovely. I uh, hope uh, you think IVVs are entertaining. P.S. You back from the UK? I did. I am back from the UK. I came back yesterday and then slept for over 15 hours, which is why the stream is a little late and disorganized. Uh, did you enjoy it? I was working, so I couldn't make it down to Bath at last. Um, the event was great. Uh, turns out Bath is like really far from London, so like after all this like giant international flying, delayed because of weather, like it was it was a hellboard ordeal. Finally get to Heathrow, and then you have to get in a car for two hours to get to Bath. It was like, oh my god, I just want to be there. I just want to like shower and sleep. Um, but the event was fantastic. I am, I'm quite excited for Imperator Rome. Uh, I think the embargo for it lifts on, I think it's Monday. I'll, I'll be double checking and stuff like that. So I can't, I can't really talk about it here. Um, but, um, I did, I, I am, I'm pretty excited for Imperator Rome. It's still, it's still like far from release. This was a very, very, very early pre-release event. Um, so it is, it is going to be a while before, uh, before it actually hits the market still. Um, but, but yeah, but yeah, should be cool. Mm -hmm. And Bath was lovely. I always tell, oh, I can always tell you which one, which, which, uh, asset Unity is about to buy because every time I buy a great access like Text Match Pro, then Unity adds it for free three months later. <laughs> But it is good because like, uh, we need it. it. To me, it's less about text mesh pro for, for the actual UI system. It was more about the text meshing system where you want like text in like your 3D view or camera view or something like that. It's just a lot better. Um, okay, we got you in there. I mean, we'll be dealing with fonts. We'll be dealing with all kinds of crap as we go forward here. It's funny that that is being clipped a little because of, of tings, but it's gonna be okay. Um, so we've got some sort of title in there and yeah, so. I guess at a certain point, we're gonna have to consider how we're populating this user interface, right? So this is our system view. Let me go and clean, close all these and just look at, um, at system view over here. So on enable, we're gonna want to do a few things. We're going to want to um, update various uh, UI elements for this system and set up the system render view so we can see planets. And it's really the second bit that I want to look at uh, today. Um, and I want to finish and, and that'll be that'll be the, the conclusion of the programming part of the stream. And then we're going to move on to some Stellaris, which should be very exciting. Because um, what I want in this view is I want to be able to see a view of the planets. So if you've played, I mean, many different games, but again, our, our example here is Master of Orion 2. When you click on a system, it opens this window and you see the, the sun and you see the planets going around it in that view. And I mean, we could do this in pure TD. We can do this all as, as a UI elements, but what I want it to be is a 3D view. And what it means is we're gonna need these objects to exist. So let's say as a dummy thing, let me get create an empty. So this is gonna be something like um, star system 
3D stuff, okay? And what I'm gonna do, well, there's a few different ways of, do, of handling this. This could be placed anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter. But what it's gonna have, it's gonna have its own camera in it. And there's gonna be some stuff inside of this, like the star, um, which... Really, we want a different version of the prefab. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure out a better system for this, but it's not gonna have its, like, UI element. Can I not? It's I guess I can't delete chocolate. it from there. Oh my god, it's more whiskey and chocolate! Hold on, one sec. Uh, I wanna remove the UI elements. There we go, and, and just apply this change over here. So, inside the star system 3D stuff, there's gonna be um, the close-up of the star, which is gonna be the exact same star, but, you know, a little bigger and zoomed in, uh, and without a label. And then it's gonna have some planets. So for, for laziness here, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna set up some spheres. Um, and so this is gonna be planet one. It's you know, whiskey and and it's gonna be offset by a certain amount in some way. So there's gonna be a planet. Why is it? Uh... Oh, cause I have a child of, he, wait, no. Why is it looking like this? Default material, why is it inheriting the glow? You know what I mean? Anyway. Sort of, kind of doesn't matter. Just a little weird. Oh, it's just a selection effect. So when it's selected, it's highlighting you. Okay, wow, it was just like, it looked like the sun effect was being copied in a weird way. Come back to it in just a second. Okay, we got a couple of whiskey and chocolate contributions coming in. Uh, cool man, hey cool man, nice to see you buddy. Was it a good 15 hour power nap of yours? Also, I was in the Old Town, an open air museum with my dad for his birthday gift this year. Oh, that sounds nice. And yeah, the, the thing is I could have kept sleeping because I don't sleep on planes. So I left, I woke up in Bath yesterday morning and you get confused as to what day it is, um, at 4 a.m. UK time, which is effectively the same as waking up at 11 p.m. my time to get into a car at 5 a.m. to drive two hours to the airport so you can get to the airport by 7 a.m to be ready ahead of time for your 9 a.m. flight. We got into the plane, it was delayed on the tarmac for an hour and a half for mechanical like maintenance things. Um, and then we finally took off. And I don't sleep on planes ever. So, and then and then you fly all the way to Toronto and then it's a couple hours because my flight, my next flight was also delayed. Then to get into the flight, to the, the little plane, it's only about an hour in the little plane uh, to actually get to my town. So there's like long travel things, but I never sleep on planes and so, I was just just totally exhausted, apparently. And I could have still slept. Like, I feel like I'm ready for a nap right now. <laughs> it's just crazy nuts. Uh, is it Mono Developer Visual Studio? So that, what you're seeing here is Visual Studio, which is now the default editor in uh, in Unity, finally, which is really nice. Because I stuck with Mono Behavior, or Mono Develop, because, because it was the, de the default, and it was just easier for like tutorial purposes and things. But it's nice to update. However, I may be making a switch to another editor. Um, at some point. More news on that later. But anyway, okay. Um, so, oh yeah, and then there was another whiskey and chocolate contribution. Who that? It was Bob! 790. Thank you very much, Bob! Slightly disappointed you aren't doing Lot and Dare this time, I know, but I guess sacrifice must be made for Project Caprica. I mean, the thing is, I wouldn't have been able to do uh, Lot and Dare anyway. Or, I mean, it would have been an extra short Lot and Dare because, like, I couldn't have started last night. And even today, like, I clearly wouldn't have had the energy for it, so it would have been a super short lot in there anyway. Um, right, okay, so set up the 3D things. So what I want is this extra little 3D view that is gonna be rendered in its own camera over here. And I think what the easiest way to set it up, and I mean, you could shove it a million miles in distance, and we may do that, but we could also do it with, with layers and stuff. So let's say we create a new layer and so this is something like system system 3D viewer or, or something like that. So there's gonna be a layer called that. And everything in here is gonna be part of the system 3D view layer. 
And this camera here is gonna be set to only render things in the system 3D layer. That's the only thing it's going to render. And with the camera preview, if we were to go and to look over here and yeah, move the camera back, there we go. So we can start to see these objects over here. So we can do something like that. And our main camera, we want to tell it to not render things on the system 3D view, which doesn't matter. If, if our things are just shoved over to the side, like let's say our default X it's position for this is like it. minus 50,000 or something like that, then we don't have to mess with this. But I think it's going to be a good idea to look into some of this. This music, I have to start playing Stellaris again, December 6th. Yeah. There's going to be some Stellaris after this, by the way, uh, with 2.2 in the Mega Corp. It's going to be start of a new Let's Play, uh, and I'm super pumped for it. Uh, it's Cool Man again. I ended up losing my Infamy War in UK with the UK and Victoria 2, but it was only a small loss. Did not lose any land to the UK. Nice, Cool Man, because that was your, was it your Korea or Vietnam campaign? Something in Southeast Asia that was a war after World War II. One of the, I can't remember because it was a few weeks ago we were talking about that, but it's kind of cool that you're doing this. Um, okay. Right, so so we'll, we're going to figure out how to... Oh, right, next thing we want to do is this camera here. I don't want it to render to the screen. This camera. And you can see like when we're moving it around, like by default, of course, cameras render to the screen. We don't want that to happen. We want it to render to a texture instead. And then what we want to do is we want to use the texture that the camera is rendering to as the background for this window. All this like pink, magenta, whatever this color is. We want to replace this with a texture that comes from the camera. So we're entering areas. This is, this is, these are areas that I haven't really played with very much, but that's going to be the goal. Now this uses a sprite, which is a source image, but we think we can interact with things. Let's, so we're gonna make, I think we're gonna make a new component here. System view camera. I don't know, texture. It's not, it's not really a texture, it's a script. Texture script. Uh, that's pretty wordy, but you can't really get confused as to what the hell's going on. Render textures are fun. I've used them to do animated textures, create a button with a 3D rotating object embedded into it. Ah, oh, that does sound really cool, actually. And I remember way back in the day where, um, like, render textures were a paid feature. There used to be a big difference between the free version of Unity and the paid version of Unity. I mean, you could do most things in the free version, but there were a few things that were locked away. And I always criticized it because it's like, the things that were locked away were things where like, you couldn't like, you couldn't do your test development. You couldn't like, you know, effectively make most of your game and be like, okay, it's a good game. Now I need to get it ready for retail and then buy the pro version at that point. Um, and so I, I thought I think it limited people who were going to move over to develop to Unity, um, because it's like literally like if I switch from free to pro, then I have to rewrite this whole feature to use the pro mechanics. It was weird, and it's like so much better now that like okay, with the free version of Unity, you have access to all the tools, so you can go and confirm that everything works, and then maybe go to the pre version so you can the free ver or the pro version so you can you know remove watermarks and you know have extra niceties and now they've moved into more of like the, the sort of service oriented stuff now it's like oh well like with the pro version then you get like the unity teams and um you know the uh the render servers and all this kind of stuff which is really wonderful and excellent okay so what we're gonna have on this script here i don't know how much how much code it's actually necessarily going to run i think we will have some sort of public is it like render texture are textures that can be rendered to yeah. It's whiskey and chocolate. Something like this. We're gonna be, we're gonna be sort of learning this together to a certain extent. Uh, close this. Close this. Check the, the whiskey and chocolate. It's cool, man. Again, it was Korea. The war was in the year 1865. I was lucky. UK had a huge rebel in a lot uh, Ireland. Rebels in Ireland. I've never heard of anything like that before. Uh, it's the same time fought a war with me. Ah, that's nice. 
the the UK having certain uh, issues is also the reason why like America exists because like the some of the stuff is going on at the same time as like um, Napoleon. I guess it'd be the War of eighteen twelve was like peak Napoleon. Crap. There's some stuff like that. I don't know. All right. So I mean, I'll probably need some examples and things. We'll load it in and, and take a look. But this equals new render texture and you can give it like yeah sizes and shit which we're probably gonna have to grab from something else we can start by copying a texture which is kind of interesting because what I'm wondering is um, you. Hmm. Because we want it to match this. I guess what we want, we need to do is we need to grab this rect transform. And this is going to be the source of the size of our texture. Create a render texture as an asset. Ah, oh, yeah, maybe. I don't know, because I think it, I, I think for maximum safety, I think what we want to do is create the render texture at runtime. Because we want the render texture to be set up to be the same size as this. And there might be reasons why, like, because we might change this to the size of this window in development. Or maybe the, the window size when it spawns will be you know, sort of scaled up. Maybe we'll have UI scaling. Maybe we'll have all, all kinds of different mechanics such that we may want to change this render texture size. So, what we kind of want to do is something like um, our transform.parent.get component in children or something. Um, I don't know if we just want to grab the sprite because there's most likely going to be multiple sprites. This is just called image. I think we want this like a system render um, texture or something like that as the name of this game object. So instead we'll probably do something like dot find. Um, find and find Find, I think we can just pass this as the child name. There's always something where I'm like, ah, how does this work? I think this will find the child of our parent called this. Now, I don't necessarily like these, like, fixed hierarchy. Oh, wait, hold on. It's ourselves. Durr, I'm on. This is the same game object I'm currently on. All right, I don't need to do this shit. So I can just say something like, uh, this script should be on the same game object as the um, image sprite. So we can go something like get component. And so the component is called image. And it has a sprite on it. Now the sprite should have a texture. There it is. So this is the actual texture of the sprite. You tell me you can't convert from a texture to D to a render texture? I don't need you to convert. I just need to like I just need you to grab the like um, 
height, width, depth, yada, 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 yada. Right, but again, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't exist yet. The sprite, the sprite object exists, or the image object exists, but it doesn't actually have a sprite at this point. It's just an empty, so there's, there actually isn't anything to copy over here. So it's more like we're just grabbing a rec transform. And I guess we're going to be using the version where we put in the height and width. That makes more sense, because yeah, the sprite the sprite is a nothing. It, it'd just be a null. So we're probably using bounds of the render texture. Hold on. What are we grabbing from this bad boy? Uh. And what should we set the depth at? Like, is it just a 32-bit, 16-bit render? Like... Zero, 16 or 24. Only, only the 24 bit has a stencil buffer. So probably a 24 bit thing. What are you whining about? Oh yeah, can't convert from float to int. True. Whoops. I, I'm not 100% sure that I'm grabbing the right numbers here. What the, what the, f how, how do I dock this again? Man, Visual Studio is weird. Yeah, I'm not 100% convinced that I'm grabbing the right source of numbers, but we'll find out. Because the texture has to be, the texture has to be an integer. Like, we have to, we're specifying a number of pixels, height and wide. And we're trying to match the number of pixels to the actual size of the rectangle on the screen. Um, if the rectangle on the screen ends up being you know, having some sort of decimal point, then there'll be a little bit of texture stretching or something. But we really, this rectangle, we really don't want it to have an odd number because we're, tr no, don't leak any more Rome shit. I mean, it's just, it's just title screen, so it doesn't matter. Um, I guess it's just close Premiere. That would be the safest thing to do. Um, right, this thing here, we just want its size to be matching, but it's anchors and stuff like that. It, it'll be fine. We'll be okay. 5.6 bytes. <laughs> <clears throat> so, it's whiskey and chocolate. It's whiskey and chocolate from Zervin Unix. Hey! Changelog. The make believe object City of Brussels has its parent owner temporarily to the entity Great Alliance. <laughs> Uh, yeah, December 6th is the ETA for 2.2 .2 and Megacorp to come out. Um, so, I mean, we've generated this texture and it's public and that's all, that's all good and lovely. Um, and then what we probably also want is, is a reference to the camera so that we can tell the camera that to use this texture here. Um, I mean, unless we set as a prefab or this or that or whatever, but I think this is going to be better. The thing is we could... Now that would be dumb. I say if we create the render texture as a as an asset, then it could be preset up to a certain size and everything. But no, we, I don't think we want that. So what we need is we need a reference to the render camera here. So public camera system render or system camera is going to be fine. Camera raw like that. And if we go from here to Unity, and actually I'll rename this camera just to keep help things be a little clearer for things. So this is the system camera. And you are going to have a reference to the system camera. So the view texture doesn't have to be public at all. Because I, I made it public because I'm like, oh, the camera has to grab it. But no, we'll have a reference to the camera here. And the system camera dot render texture.
target texture. Target texture is equal to this. Now I'm going to take this whole system, star system 3D stuff. I'm just going to shove it under system view over here. Which I think will be fine. That way as the system view gets enabled and disabled, so will everything beneath it. So let's see how many errors we get when we hit play here. Well, it's not going to be when we hit play, it's going to be when we click on a star. We got one error. Oh, yep, that's fine and expected and kind of okay. Now, the system camera. Okay, the system camera's got a camera preview that is good. It's whiskey and chocolate. And we've got a texture. It's whiskey and chocolate. Have you tried P3D Flight Simulator? I have, actually. I've got some videos for that on the channel. These days, I'm much more into um, X-Plane, actually. Oh, it's Kumat again. Playing this war of mine at the same time as watching live stream. I have 963 units of fuel already. What do you say to that? That sounds pretty good. It's been a while since I've played um, this war of mine. Actually, it's been a long time. Twitch is broken. Free subs. Wait, what? <laughs> Weird. Weird, but awesome, I guess. Good for me. How do we check that this texture is actually being run? Well, I guess we can't. Other than we need to turn around. I guess we just need to finish this code. Fair enough. In our system view, uh, no, sorry, in this script over here. So we now have a texture, and now what we need to do is we need to create a new sprite. Sprite, sprite equals new 7up. Um, do you not take arguments? I guess not. No. Okay, does not contain a constructor that takes zero argument. Great. Why aren't you contextually giving me the number of arguments here? You are very annoying. Oh, right. You use a static method create instead. Why is that? It probably has to do with the fact that sprites are like, it's just like game objects. You don't really work with uh, with constructors or anything like that. So yeah, okay. So sprite.create, very confusing. Um, see, it wants a reference. To a texture. Okay, hold on. I think a couple of things. Yes. Yes, indeed. I don't want to use the, the sort of default image script over here. Instead, there's a different one. Probably raw image is what I want to use. Blah, 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 blah. Because the image script needs, like, the sprite image, which does different things. If I remove you and add a raw image instead, yeah, you're just happy taking a basic texture in here. And a material? Are you happy with this? Yes, you can just point the render texture. Good. Is that sufficient? Or do you need a material applied as well? Oops, this isn't going to work because I need to 
um, hide the system view until I click on a star. Success! Okay. We got there, guys. Woo! Um, and this error is still, this is still code that just doesn't do what it's supposed to do. That's fine. I can just ignore that. Um, yes. Or, wait. No, this is correct. Oh, it's because, hang on, in my prefab of the star close-up, I need to get rid of the clickable star component. There you go. That's why I'm getting errors. The sun, it's too bright! Uh, so star 45, we click on it and we get this. Awesome. Okay, this is exactly the sort of thing we were hoping to get to. So now what we, we have is the second camera that's rendering a view to some texture, which we're just applying in the window, which is going to be good. Now, I mean, we're going we're gonna to have to move it around. We're going to have to move this back. We're going to have to put the planets in the right area, all this stuff. Possibly, we're going to want that camera to be orthographic. Because, I mean, you can see the stretching here because it's, this is on the edge of the field of view. And probably it makes much more sense to have it the other way. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, camera. We'll make this change. I guess we can just make the change here. I know you're disabled right now. Activate you. There you go. We got a little preview we can look at. Um, we're going to have to figure out something with distance. So yeah, orthographic, I think, is going to be better. So it's just going to be a nice, nice flat perspective. And yeah, we'll have to have like multiple planets at different coordinates. or, you know, sort of at different distances from the sun. And there you go, something like that. And then the planets are gonna need their own labels and so on and so forth. What we don't do right now is on our stars during our galaxy generation phase, we don't generate planets yet. Um, so let's do that real quick. And that might sort of bring us to the end of what we're gonna do today. Yeah, I definitely want ortho. I agree, yeah, I, I think it's gonna look a lot better. Uh, how did you learn programming uh, by yourself? You took some courses. Basically by myself, partially because I am very old. Which is, oh, okay, gonna make some other people in chat feel like excessively old. But um, yeah, there was basically no option but to learn myself. When I was, um, uh, when I was eight, I learned the logo programming, which technically was like a little summer, like week long course. Um, but um, I taught myself basic when I was 10 because I had access to a computer um, that had basic on it. It was the Atom from Coleco, uh, which is very old. Um, and then in high school, I taught myself uh, C and C++ from books. And I did go to university for computer uh, development, but this back in the day, there was no, it was actually this shitty. All the courses were in Pascal and things. It was just absolutely awful and terrible. And I learned nothing um, in any of those courses. It was all self-taught. Um, so I'm very jealous for people who actually, you know, get proper programming courses in say high school and things these days. You guys are really lucky. Mm-hmm. Have t-shirts as old as you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a slight headache. I'm taking a painkiller here. That's what you get when you sleep too little or too much. Which I think I got both. I don't think I slept enough to recover from everything, but it was also like I keep saying 15 hours of sleep. It's 13. No, no, 15. Yeah, yeah. 15 hours of sleep. So yeah, too much. But I could have kept going. Uh, right, so I want to just generate some little um, some little uh, planets for us. So our star system here, we've got the star system generate, and then we have this like generate planets, which doesn't do anything. Um, I don't think the function even exists, or does it? Oh, it does, but nothing happens. So we're gonna want to just write a little bit of code for our planet generation and think think about how that might work. Um, yeah, zero to max planets. How many planets? We sort of ballpark like maybe six is a good number. I think we're, we're really gonna standardize on something like that. So we're gonna plan for up to six planetary orbits. And actually, let's take a look at how that might look here. Let's, um, okay, in our visual, and you gotta look at this tiny little window here for our camera preview. I mean, unless we somehow change things to run in like, in editor, but then it, wouldn't, it still wouldn't have a star system reference. I don't know. Um, and also distances. I guess just to standard on, standardize on things, let's say when we're zoomed in on our star system, 
each orbit of the planet will be one unity unit over. That's going to be our radius. Each orbit is going to be a, uh, a multiple of one unity unit of thing. And then we can just scale the size of the planets and, and the camera area to look good within that, okay? So um, planet one, two, three, four, five, six. And we're just going to offset you so you're going to have two. And this is just going to be a straight line for now. I mean, obviously, we'll want to rotate them, you know, different things at some point. Uh, I think I just typed in two again. I did. So three, four, oops, five, six. Also, our camera needs to be square. Um, okay, right, I guess this camera preview is going to be the same, um, the, in the preview it's going to be the same aspect ratio as our main camera, but the actual camera sort of size and shape is going to be based on the texture. Yeah, it's going it's to be okay. So we've got this, and right now all of our spheres are, are a unit of one, so they're going to have to be scaled down. Probably, I suspect, like we're going to want them to be quite big in here. Whoa. Okay. Um... You know, just because it'll be easy to see and to click on. I think something like this is probably going to be a fairly reasonable representation. Again, these are going to be orbited around. They're all going to have their own label a little bit too. Eh, we may have to change. We may have to space these out a bit more. Or again, effectively, spacing them out is just going to be, is equivalent to just shrinking down these planets and just being zoomed in more. So maybe... Maybe a quarter like this. I mean, you know, we're gonna want gas giants to look a little bigger and so on. We're just, we're sort of, we're just ballparking things to try to get a good sense. I think what we might do for our star is shrink it by half. Like that. Now you can't see it because of the freaking camera icon and things. But I think something like this is gonna lead to something that's gonna look kind of okay in our preview here. And it'll all change once we get the graphics in there, once we get labels and you know how we're gonna deal with things, but just sort of eyeballing things like that. Anyway, and the idea was about six of these orbits is gonna be good. Not each one of these orbits is gonna be filled, you know, so we might have planets one, four, five, and uh, maybe an asteroid belt uh, in, the, in the three slot or something like that, you know, but I think that's gonna be okay. Rotate the camera up to 45 degrees in the plane of the elliptical. And yeah, I kind of like that too, where we're gonna have like, we might still use an orthographic camera, but have it a little tilted like this so that there's things in the front and the back. But those are like, those are, those are, those are later concerns. Ooh, I just got hungry. See, this is what I get for not having breakfast before the stream, too. Um, and I've been gone for a week. I don't even know if, what kind of food we have in the house. Uh, so, I think six is a pretty good, good thing. So, we're going to want some sort of four loop. where there's like a chance to spawn things. Like there's so many things like, there's so many things to wait. Um, this is one of these things we're gonna revisit. Like what we might wanna do instead of a for loop, because one of the things we can do is for loop. So for each one of these, there's like a 25% chance that there'll actually be a planet in, in, this, in this thing, or maybe 50% chance, 50 is probably good. So that means on average, a star system will have three-ish planetary bodies. It's very unlikely they'll have zero. It's also very unlikely that they'll have all six. But we might want to we might want to do things differently instead. We might want to like we might want to pre-pick the number of planets we're gonna have and then assign them to the orbits afterwards. Like there's, there's both ways can go. Um the the star type might also influence um, uh, the, you know, likelihood, likely hood. I don't know. I can't spell whatever it's, I feel like there's like a Y and seven other L's in there. Um, the lack of sleep is catching up, um, of, of, you know, number of planets or something like that too. But We'll just do the basics right now. So we'll we'll say uh, we'll say fifty percent chance. So um, if random dot range, um, we'll use floats. So, so from zero f to one f, 
is greater than 0.5F. That, that's going to be our percentage chance of doing Actually, we sort of want to do less. Uh, so something like um, float uh, planet chance equals 50%. Right, so if we put this to one, if this was under then, it would be okay. Here, less than or equal to or something like that. Um, make a planet. So, what? Okay, listen. This. Why is it not tabbing me to the height that I want to be tabbed at? God damn it, Visual Studio. I don't know why people sing your praises. Some of your are, things are more annoying than mono behavior. Sure. Um, so, planet planet equals new planet and so that's lovely good excellent and so how's our planet class look like yeah, we've got some stuff going on one of the things we're gonna have to talk about at some point is we may not want to have all these various statistics actually be standalone um, public stuff I've been thinking especially from the point of view of making things a little easier to design our UI it might actually be much easier for us to have some sort of like whether it's public or not, we'll figure that out later. Um, um, values. So this is a pu it's an array of, not floats, it's actually probably a dictionary where you have a string with the name of the value and the floats in here. Um, num values. Something like that. Maybe you have another one for like text values. So there's not really very many text values other than planet having a name. I think all the values on a planet are basically this. And then um, actually rather than a string, what you really have here is maybe an enum of all the values or something like that. And I think that might be a little easier for you when you build a UI to just be able to say this text field and then have like, um, uh, if, if you reference like an enum type, in Unity, in the the inspector, it'll actually give you a drop-down menu. So for this text field, drop-down menu, uh, show me the population or whatever, or something like that. But we'll, we'll deal with that later on. Could the plants have small moons attached to them? Yeah, there's no reason we couldn't do stuff like that. Now, whether or not the moon is sort of its own true planetary body that you can colonize as if it was a planet or something like that, that's... that I don't know. Um... But graphically, like as part of our planet graphic, we can have some planets that have the image of the moon that's orbiting them. Um, and we could also have that sort of as a trait, like a planet with a moon gets, you know, just 20% more more space. Cause, or, you know, like room for, for buildings and whatnot. Uh, however you work it, your population cap, there you go. So if we're, we're copying Master of Orion, right? In Master of Orion, each planet has a, has a size and the combination of the size, the type, and your personal racial traits determines the maximum population on a planet. Um, and uh, so let's say a planet would have a size 12. But if the planet has like a flag that like, oh, this is a planet with a moon, where like a moon is just a special feature, right? Like some planets have gems, so they give you a bonus to how much money you make. Some planets have whatever. Well, you just have a trait on a planet that this planet has a moon, like, or a useful moon almost. Um, and so what it does is it gives you 20% more to your maximum population because you're also going to be living on the moon at the same time. And that's like super easy to do. That's like such a trivially easy thing to implement, um, but makes the, the galaxy feel a lot more detailed and living. Um, and that's probably the way to do it in this, this type of game with the level of detail that we've got here. That I think is the correct approach. <laughs> I've been thinking, when a coder says that, run away, your budget just doubled and your delivery date just jumped six months. Ha <laughs> uh, ha Have you tested the JetBrains Rider IDE? I haven't tried it, it looks rather nice. Rider is actually the IDE I'm considering making a change to. The people, so I was at the Unite conference in LA um, about a month ago, two months ago, I don't remember when it was. Um, and that is the, the Unity convention. They have them all over the world. They have them a couple of times a year, I think. Um, and I went there and the, the rider people had a booth and I was checking it out and I got their presentation. And that is a slick ass IDE, uh, really, really good. Um, and uh, I, uh, I asked them, but it's paid, it's not free. So I asked them and I did get a, uh, I did get a code uh, to try it out. And, um, and I'm very tempted to make the switch to it. The problem being then, if I'm doing these tutorials with this IDE, 
then first of all, we're back to having questions of like, why is your, what's your ID? It looks different than mine because I'm not using Visual Studio. And then the people want to like, you know, copy along would have to get this like paid product um, if, if they want to copy it exactly. And it's, I don't know, it's tempting because it looks really, really nice. I, I like it a lot. But because it's not free, I'm leery about using it for, for tutorial content. Yeah. Uh, apparently, if you've got a, if you've got an open source project or something, you can you can sort of get some codes. But this this would be different. They're not going to like give us a thousand codes or whatever for all the viewers. So anyway, um, right, planet stuff. Yeah. Okay. So star system. So we make a planet, and I I just got total. Um, what's it called? Is it syntactic satiation? This doesn't look like a word anymore. But I'm going to assume it's correct. Um, name is just going to be something like our star's name plus the planet's position. Which is I plus one. Um, to do. To do. Hey, you know what? Hold on. Um... Void generate planet name, first of all. Um, int pause. Uh, it's not a void. It returns a string. So we'll make this sexier later. That's what we're going to do. Uh, boom. I. Boom. Like that. Oh, yeah. We're not returning things. Um, you're just going to be returning the star name plus this. Plus the pause plus one dot two string like this um we're clearly like to do make awesome you know like convert the this number to maybe a a roman number or this or that or alpha beta etc etc you know some some sort of thing but we've got it as some sort of as some sort of function that we can tweak later on that's going to be okay so the planet's going to have a name um i mean and it needs other things right it's going to need a bunch of code in here for the type and the likelihood of different things. The type, the size, the this, the that. Um, like, so. Funny sounds with my mouth, da 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 da. So. Uh, where are the Neenums? Are they part of planet? No, they're not. So, um, planet size. I'm trying to remember. There's not a, um, this is something that happens with Enum. There's, no, there's gotta be a way to, it's, it's awkward, isn't it? It's, is it like Enum, which is part of the system class. Like, if you just want to get the maximum range of your enums, um, like, get values of type, of, like, it's super awkward, isn't it? Of planet size. Dot length. I think this is a way that you, you do it technically. Although I've seen people do a cool little things where you do something like size of over here as your final thing in your enum. Cause then you can do something that's quite a bit more handy feeling uh, by doing planet size dot size of. And this gives you this, the, the length of this enum. Um, oh yeah, you gotta force cast it to an int. Usually count, a oh, count maybe, yeah. And so this is not like, this is not a coding thing, but it like, it feels, it's sort of a, a bit of a hack to make it feel the way that you like. But it feels like there should be an easier way, like this is a hack to get the, the length of this enum basically. And this is not a hack 
but it feels super mega awkward. And it feels like there's something missing. Every time I do this, I'm like, I'm clearly just missing something. There's some there's something in the code in, in C sharp or something that makes this way more useful. The advantage of this is it's super goddamn fast. Like honestly, I think this can be this can be like basically autofilled at compiler time without running code. Whereas this is like, okay, we need to call multiple functions and do multiple conversions and yeah, yeah, yeah. A super neat trick and way better than enum you know, get values to me. Yeah, it is. I, I sort of, I, I, I am like internally kind of allergic to it because it feels like a hack. And you have to remember to like add the stupid like count field at the end of your enums explicitly. Like it's almost like, why doesn't it, it you, you kind of want the lot language to almost implicitly add this like reserved enum at the end of every enum list to do this for you. <clears throat> I prefer the unsigned int enums for bitmask and cc++. An endless space where you could explore them for a change in bonus or no. I haven't played enough endless space to be able to to, to follow along with that. Um. Anyway, what, what, what are we doing? I want. How, what's the best way to do like weighted stuff, right? Like, cause I want to assign a, a a random or a random but weighted planet size. So, I want to, and it would be nice if there was like a built-in like pick a random enum. But I mean, it's because if you want to pick a random thing from this, what you have to do is again you have to use this enum class, get values of the type of planet size. Um. And then this is an array where then you can feed in a number, so random range from zero to size max. So this will assign, um, if I get all my parentheses, this will assign a random planet size to this. And so th this is always the awkward thing. If you're not using enums, you don't have to really go through so much work to get this shit done. Oh, also, um, because we've imported the system namespace there's a system.random and there's a unity engine.random to do so meh get value where is random oh unity engine anyway um, what are you actually complaining about cannot comp convert from object to planet size oh right and then And we have to cast it. Like, if we replaced these planet size things, right? Instead of using enums, if we just had this be an integer and the size went from zero to five or whatever, we wouldn't have to deal with all this bullshit. On the other hand, it's super nice and convenient to have these enums so that you know explicitly that you're doing things in the right range. Uh, sorry you got blocked there. Oh, I want names instead of values. You're right. Or, well, no, okay, for length. Yeah, sorry, uh, Mubot there. Or, sorry, uh, Malachi Kid for getting blocked. If I go and replace... This is... Hold on. There. So, yeah, and helper functions and all that. Absolutely. I mean, ultimately, you end up doing the same thing. But we'll pro we probably will go and, and hide the, some of this crap behind helper functions. So, we'll, we'll see what the actual solution is. But the point is, um, this picks a random one. But we don't want a random one. I will want a weighted one. For example, like we might want to make it explicitly like, listen, the star, the planet in the zeroth position, right? The closest to the sun 
we don't want a we don't want a big ass jet gas giant there right this planet size is also tight which is the whole other thing um we want per, sort of percentage chances weighted chances of stars so the sort of um the further away you are from the sun the larger the bodies might be or maybe there's a sweet spot in the middle and then the, also a weighted chance because the planets also have a base type um of of this the planet type right there's there's th two special types there's asteroid is a special type gas giant is a special type and then there's all the sort of subtypes over here so near the sun radiated barren maybe toxic is much more common and then in the sweet spot in that like two three four spot right the um uh the goldilocks zone Right, that's where you're most likely to find your continental, your Gaians, or oceanics, and things like that. Well, Gaians probably going to be a special thing that doesn't get assigned um, uh, randomly, necessarily, or, or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, and then when you are are further away from the sun, you're more likely to get your gas giants. So, I mean, the code for determinants can really fit either in planet or star system. It doesn't really matter. I guess I'll put it in star system because it's also where I'm putting in the generate planet name. Um, and do you put in switches? Do you put in... Can you generate a Gaussian distribution function to select the planet type? Well, I know some of those words, but yeah. Uh, what I can see us doing is some sort of function. I'll just put a void for now. Uh, generate planet type, int pause. Um, it's And I can see us doing something like um, gas giant weight, where we set this weight to be a sliding field, um, probably like a lerp or something, where the odds of getting a gas giant goes from zero to and this is not this is not sort of an odd. I mean, it, it's a weight. Uh, if if something has a like anything above zero and everything else is zero, then this would be a guaranteed chance. But we'll we'll assume the weight ranges can go from zero to one. So in this case, yeah. So we'll we'll say the the chance of getting a gas giant goes from zero to one as your position. Um, we'll probably want some sort of float for this, which is um, distance. Uh, which is going to be equal to the position divided by the max planets. Um, again, I don't know exactly where the float conversion will happen, and I want to make sure it doesn't get like chunky and rounded. I'll just force floats over here. So this will return a number um, from zero from zero to one, where zero is the closest possible planet to the sun, and one is the furthest possible planet from the sun. And so based on this distance here, as the distance grows, the weight of getting a gas giant goes up. And we can combine that with a few other things. Like we can have multiple ones of these things all interacting. Um, like uh, another one, which is sort of um, like, uh, maybe, maybe we just put in like, like literally Goldilocks weight. Gold, I'm getting a lot of problem where like words don't look like words. Um, where this is a little different. The chance goes up to one as the distance approaches zero, or as it approaches, say, 0.5. So I'd actually, I don't think we use a lerp for this exactly. Well, we, oh, we do sort of, as we want, um, we want to sort of do an absolute. So mathf dot absolute of so 
So if we do 0.5f minus distance. So if the distance is zero, so close to the sun, this will return 0.5f. If it's one, which is very far from the sun, this will return minus 0.5f, which will get turned into an absolute value of 0.5. Um, and then, so if we just do two times whatever this returns and invert this, so the Goldilocks number, when this hits zero, so this is if our distance is actually like 0 0.5, if we're halfway from the closest to the furthest, then we end up with a, a value of 0.5 over here, which means this will return zero. So this will be turned into zero, which means it'll lean towards a weight of one for the Goldilocks weight. There you go. So we have something like that. And then we take all these weights and sort of add them together for the weight range. And then we do a random number from zero to the maximum number of all the weights together. And then we sort of do a switch or no, actually it would be like a, a chain of if else things to find which range we actually fit into. And then we return that as the planet type. There's probably a better way, I suspect. But yeah, most programming is math at some point. I mean, what we're trying to do is generate some sort of like, yeah, with, with this, and, and certainly it is, because we're trying to try to use math to make a solar system that feels balanced, randomized, but, but likely. And technically with this one, um, the way this is going to be made, because we'll have a zero weight. If you're literally the closest in, in the in the cl position close to the sun, you can't be a gas giant. But technically a gas giant becomes possible anywhere. And we might want to do um, we might want to do exponentials here. Right. Some sort of curve that goes like that, uh, especially with the gas giant. I suspect we're going to want to do some some sort of thing like this. In fact, they'll probably be I'm betting we're going to want a distance like squared. which is distance times distance. Like I can see us referencing that a lot, um, and especially for the gas giant. This will dramatically lower the chance of hitting a gas giant the closer you are to the sun, because you're multiplying two numbers that are that are smaller than one together. So it's gonna be a, a much smaller number. So your curve for this is gonna be it's going to stay near zero for a long time and then go up to one fairly rapidly. So mostly this will mean that we're only going to get gas giants probably in the fifth and sixth position and very rarely anywhere else. Yeah, I think not so much a nested if, but a chained if, right? So you bail early. Um, some damn thing like that. Leave space based off star color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was another thing we talked about. You know, we talked about somewhere here, right? So the Goldilocks range changes based on the temperature of the sun. So for a cool sun, yeah, cool suns should have uh, Goldilocks. Every time I spell it, it looks like I'm spelling some sort of like you know, sex toy. I'm having a really hard time today. Um, uh, should have Goldilocks closer to the sun. Hot suns should have it further. Right? And that, so somewhere in here, we start messing with that. Need more coffee? Yeah, probably. It's actually not coffee. I was saying coffee because of this, but it's actually some... Some Coke Zero, which also has caffeine, but has the advantage of bubbles. I like my bubbles. I honestly don't think more caffeine is going to make the difference. It's going to be just the same number of mistakes that are just happening faster. I think what we're going to do is we're going to wrap it up here. I very much, I know there's always inevitably someone in the, uh, the, the chat or, you know, YouTube comments and things like this who has considerably more math expertise than me. I'm, I would not be surprised if I get an email from someone with like an interesting model for this. But yeah, so at some point we're gonna do something like float all weights. So it's gonna be something like all the weights that we figured out it oops, is it gonna be equal to this uh, plus this. 
And then we're going to do something like um, float um, r is going to be equal to random dot range from zero to all weights. And then we're going to do an if r is less than gas giant weight, then it's a gas giant. Else if r is, um, is less than... It gets kind of awkward. Uh, to do and then return. It might be actually be easier to do something like, okay, um, R minus equals gas giant weight. And then instead of nested ifs, it's more like now, okay, if it's less than Goldilocks weight, then it's a Goldilocks planet. Then we return, and then r minus equals Goldilocks weight, and so on. Um, I mean, this always needs some sort of return. Well, here it's void, but it's going to return a um, planet type. Um, I guess we don't actually have... The default. I don't know, asteroids. You know, uh, sorry, planet type dot asteroid. Uh, maybe some sort of system like this is the way to do it. Uh, it's not actually continental. The Goldilocks is going to be anything that's like makes sense as a habitable one. So it might be continental, it might be oceanic, it might be something, you know, tund even maybe even tundra or something like that. Um, but we'll see. So yeah, we'll we'll do that. Don't the weights have to be stored in falling order for that to work? No. No, they don't. Imagine a situation where all the weights end up being one. So the all weights um, become something like, so in this case, uh, let, let's say we've got like, we got, we've got a total of four different ones of these weights, okay? And each one um, can have a weight of, of one. And, and let's say they all happen to roll somehow so they all have a weight of one, which means all weight is equal to four. So we're gonna get a random number from zero to four. So then we say something like, hey, did we roll between, effectively what we're asking here is R, is R less than one? If it is, oh, okay, then it's a gas giant. If it's not, so R was over one, so it's gonna be, it's either in, you know, anywhere from a value of one to four. So then we remove one from that. So now R is somewhere between zero and three. And then we ask again, is R again less than one? In which case it's Goldilocks. If it's not, that meant R was actually somewhere from one to three. So again, we remove one from that. So now we have an R that's somewhere between zero and two, and we just keep repeating. Um, and that'll work, I believe this will work regardless of what the weights actually roll. And even if they're different, right? So if if it ends up being, like if we're in the sixth place, so it's very likely to get a gas giant and very unlikely to get a Goldilocks, then the gas giant weight will be maybe a one and the Goldilocks will maybe be like 0.1, which means all weight will be something like 1.1. So we're gonna get a random number from one to, to, to or from zero to 1.1. And so then we say, hey, are you less than one? In which case you're a gas giant. If you're not, we remove one from that. And then we end up with a number that's like zero to 0 0.1, which is gonna be less than the Goldilocks weight. And obviously we're gonna have to have some sort of like, we're gonna have some sort of default weight. Like there's always um, float asteroid weight, which is gonna be something like, there's always a chance we're gonna get asteroids in a slot instead of something else if there's a planet at all, although we determine if there's a planet at all over here. Um, so then, yeah, we just add it in like this and we don't have to do an if check for it. If we get here, it's because we rolled in the, in the asteroid. Wait, um, there's always a possibility that, that I'm, I'm off in like several different ways, like either code or logic or, or math or over here, but I believe this is basically correct. That really won't work right. It's possible. Uh, and, and I'm too tired for the math too. We're, we're eyeballing this and what I'll do is I'll actually like run some examples on paper or something like that at some point to, to, know, um, to know something. But I think 
again, I want to figure out like what, what's the cleanest way to sort of implement this. Um, Cause the other way is like, if there were nested ifs or something like that, like you'd still have to do a range. But I think this works. So, someone will figure it out. Um, you know, correct my things, or we'll, we'll notice in debug when we start running it. We are going to wrap up the programming here. We did almost two hours here. Um, we don't actually have the planets truly being generated at this point, but it's pretty damn close. Uh, and then we'll be running some tests to see, hey, do these solar systems feel relatively correct or not? Um, you know, and then, and then we're going to, yeah, just lots and lots of different, like, I'm sure this isn't going to feel quite right. We'll do tons of tweaking as we go forward. Um, and we figure out the different star types and what the game balance should be. Like how often should there be habitable planets? And actually that'll probably be a game setting that you can set up. Um, like when you set up, um, I don't know if Stellaris has it, but when you set up a game in distant worlds, right? You can tweak the likelihood of getting colonizable planets, which means what we're probably going to do is embiggen the Goldilocks range, right? But mostly from, from this number here. Um, this number here determines how likely it is we're going to have a planet within the Goldilocks range. Um, and in particular, this number here is probably heavily going to be big. So yeah, we're going to have some sort of like float um, Goldilocks, Goldilocks range, which we're going to set to this. Um, tweak this based on planet or er, star type and galaxy settings. Use an alias for random I'm using random. Oh yeah, that's true. All right. Yes. We're gonna wrap up the programming here. I'm very happy. I was actually a little bit surprised at how well the Compile, 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 compile. There we go. Um, the uh, the render texture went. I actually expected, because it's not something I do very often, I expected to run into more issues where I'm like, oh, hold on, I gotta recheck the documentation for this. But we've got this custom little render area. It's also set up where it literally doesn't matter. Like we've got this render area for the planet view set off screen, but it doesn't actually matter where it is because we're using filters for that. Um, as we click on different stars, which you're still technically allowed to do, it might, yeah, click star. Oh, because of the name of the star. That's fine. Um, yeah, we'd have to close this window to be able to redo some more. That, that's fine. Um, this, this actually worked out surprisingly well with the render texture. I'm very pleased with it. Very happy with that. I think it'll be a lot of fun to work with. I think it'll look cool. And it's something that I want to like put into practice because this is a useful tool for all kinds of things. <laughs> Setting up a secondary camera to record something to a texture and then using that texture to something else is really useful. Let's say you're doing, um, let's say, because we're, we're in the space mood right now. Let's say you're playing, you're doing a space sim game instead where you're, you're flying spaceships, okay? And on the dashboard, like you can target an enemy ship and on your dashboard, you have like a display that's got like the close up of the ship you're targeting. Now, whether that's part of your user interface or literally like as you look around in your cockpit, there's a computer screen there with it. Well, so what you can do is on an enemy ship that you've got targeted, you stick a camera right next to it to record to a texture. And then you take that texture and you put it on your dashboard. So you got a nice zoom into the ship, even though it's still, you know, a hundred thousand kilometers away in space or something. And it's like a rear view mirror. Yes. Rear view mirror is a perfect example as well. You stick a camera on the back of your, your, vehicle, whether that's a spaceship or a, a car or something like that, a camera going backwards, recording to a, um, a texture and you apply it to your rear view mirror. Uh, and that's a great way of doing things. So it's such a handy little trick to do and lets you do really cool things. It doesn't actually add very much overhead. Um, depends on what you're doing. In this case here, it won't because we've got the camera called aggressively to only render certain types of objects. So it only checks things in a certain layer. Um, so this, this is really fast. Um, I mean, if you're doing something in such a way that is going to render the entire universe twice, then that might not be quite as optimal, but then you just, you just work with that. Raining? Raining. I don't know what you mean by raining. Um, but, um, although speaking of things like raining and water effects, one of the reasons a long time ago you couldn't, there was a free version of sort of water and a paid version of water is because the paid version of water, because if you do reflections reflections are basically render textures as well. 
Um, because what a, what a reflection is, whether you're talking about a mirror or a rain puddle or anything in between, um, or shiny metal, is basically a camera that's sort of like recording things in the opposite direction and then applying the texture on there. I mean, unless, you know, you've got the fancy new ray tracing and everything. But anyway, I think we're going to wrap up the programming here. If you guys got any more little questions or comments about the programming, throw them in now. Otherwise, we're going to load up some uh, Stellaris. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rack. I have a whole programming channel, actually. And uh, that channel is supported by some lovely uh, Patreon people. And uh, I feel like we haven't been doing enough for them lately. So there's going to be that. There's going to be another stream tomorrow is the plan. Starting at 1 p.m., we're going to do a little bit more programming. Um, and then maybe also a little more Stellaris that day. So yeah, it starts at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the reason for that is a Kiss for Luck streams from 11 to 1 uh, p.m. Eastern time on Sundays. And I didn't want to step on her stream. So we'll start at 1 and then go for... I don't know, maybe, maybe another four-ish hours, we'll see, as a combination of programming and some Stellars. Well, we have to wait one more week before the next Farming Sim video. Uh, yeah, because I think we're going to record on Tuesday again, um, and then hopefully have the video up by Wednesday. But it's certainly going to be a few days before the next uh, Farming Simulator. What's the biggest Eureka moment for you in programming slash making games? That's really hard to say. That's really hard to say. Um, again, I think coming from a background of web development and learning the model view component kind of system in, in web development, uh, which was amazing, and then realizing you could apply that to game design, I think that's a big thing. Um, but also uh, being able to um, use anonymous functions and um, and lambdas and stuff like that is like some of those things where like it's such an easy and trivial thing to implement in code, but is so powerful. In many ways, we've used it. We've used it for many things. Um, uh, in particular, it's really nice for making like tech trees and sort of um, um, arbitrary spells and things like that. In previous love and and tutorials. So yeah, Lam lambda is an artificial function or um, anonymous functions or something that I really enjoyed um, with web programming. Like most of my web programming was server side and database stuff. But um, when you're working in JavaScript, which I mostly did as a client size thing, JavaScript has a lot of really strong bits. It has a lot of shitty bits, but the flexibility of treating functions as objects was always really cool. So simple but powerful, yeah. Any plans for the months we should know about? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think, again, I think on Monday is the... Um, is the embargo date for Rome from Pier to Rome from the event? So expect a bunch of news from me and lots of other people on there. I, I'll double check. I think Monday is correct. I'll, I'll have to double check before I actually get my videos up, so I don't break embargoes. But I'm pretty sure that is correct. Um, well, that I don't know. You gotta Dwarf Fortress has to come back to the streams very soon. It has to because I'm starting to go kind of crazy without it. Um, yeah, we'll see. All right, so let's uh, let's put an official cut here in the programming and get started on some stars. Mm -hmm. All right, you're doing a lot of there. It's on right now. Mr. Willow, because I just came back from uh, out of the country uh, a few minutes ago. Well, not a few minutes ago. L l yesterday. I only woke up a few minutes before the stream. It just wasn't going to be a possibility, and I knew I wanted to do this programming. So either way, get to code. So I'm going to hide this. I'm going to stop the soundtrack from playing on Spotify. Although I'm so happy that Paradox publishes all their soundtracks on Spotify. It's so good. I'm going to close this. Close this. I know you guys can't see it, but that'd be the way that it's going to be. Minimize and load up actual Stellaris. Before we start, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to take a two minute uh, bio break just to make sure we can continue without interruption. I've got to make sure to update the um, title and everything. Um, Stellaris 2.2 Mega Corp. Like that. Change the category to Stellaris. Boom. Boom. Change the what game?
that. This is going to be 2.2. Uh, outdated mods. Oh, yeah. Um, disable, disable, disable. Okay. Play. Have you heard an advent of code? No, I saw you or someone else mention it earlier. I have not. I'm not aware of what that is. I'm assuming it's like code every day before Christmas. I mean, growing up, I certainly had advent calendars filled with chocolate. Mm-hmm. There's a whiskey retail maker corp. We'll see. I got a few ideas. I have I have one I'm probably gonna do. I'm not sure. There's so many good options. And even outside of Megacorps, um, 2.2 has dramatically changed the game. And it feels like I got I gotta like replay every idea I've ever had ever. But we will see. Just gonna confirm that the game loads, get it all set up, and then yeah, two minute break. I'm gonna go pee. <laughs> do, 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 do. Almost everyone is doing good. And, and that's the thing, right? It's like, they will because it's the expansion. So do we also do it because it's new? And the thing is, there's so many different flavors of Megacorps, which is super, super freaking interesting. And even if we don't play a Megacorps, we're going to run into other Megacorps in there. Uh, I played a bunch on the uh, on the flight back over, and like I spawned next to uh, a criminal syndicate. So right away, they're opening their like illegal drug labs and everything on my planet and driving up the crime. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so different. There's so much to deal with. Hey, Taki! Didn't I share this already last week? Oh, oh, your, your resub message. Yeah, it feels like you did. I don't know. You can go communist now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's the thing, the... Um, the last Let's Play we did for Stellaris, which was the, the Gaian Resorts Corporation, would so have made sense with this expansion. And I love that run. That was such a, uh, to me, that was such a cool vibe. Um, and it would make so much more sense in this expansion. Could always be, play Space Communist. What's funny, I don't know if you guys watch the, uh, the Paradox Dev Clashes, right? The big multiplayer games that Paradox runs and streams now. And for Stellaris, right? So they started this Dev Class for 2.2 and Megacorp, and like, um, I don't know, like, if I think at least a third of the galaxy are playing as, like, some sort of communist or socialist kind of, uh, government. Really funny. Really funny. It's uh, the chocolate. church is cool. We're gonna talk about a few ideas. Okay, this is clearly loading. Willem Julius, thank you very much for that. Let's read that, and then I'm gonna go and take my little, uh, let my little break. We'll be back, and we'll start. We'll have different ideas. What we might do, actually, this might be a good way to spend a lot of the stream, is just make make multiple um, uh, different um, empires, okay? Make a bunch of empires, uh, not necessarily the one we're gonna play, but make a bunch of them at, to populate the galaxy and then figure out which one of those we're gonna play from in there. That actually sounds like really fun and do the thing where like we force them to show up um, in the thing. Oh my God, we're gonna have to redo the sentient waffle irons. They can't be played right now. We've got to tweak them for the uh, the DLC. I still think this was this was great too. So well, I think we're gonna make a ton of different empires, and then we'll figure out who we want to play from that batch. Oh, okay. BS. Short break. I will be back after uh, after I go bio. Where's my break screen? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> 